I'll be doing uh, some more readings from Socrates about Socrates via Plato. This reading today is from Plato's Symposium. Post a link. I'm really fascinated with Socrates. He is credited as one of the founding fathers of Western philosophy. A, a different philosophy in his time, quite different than philosophy in our time. 470 BC to 399 BC, roughly, is when he lived. One of the first philosophical quotes that I ever took notice of, attributed to Socrates, that a life not considered is not worth living. So when Socrates came along, he was looking at things really differently than philosophers had before then. He was not asking questions anymore about how the world is, but was more asking how shall we best live in the world. So that was pretty revolutionary at the time. And I would say personal. Talk about personalism in another reading and several probably in the future, I imagine. I, I really don't have any plans. I'm just doing this kind of in the moment as I feel to, and we'll just see where it goes. Just these are more notes to myself than anything. And just trying to keep my own thoughts organized a little better when I can spontaneously rifle through them and, and associate kind of images to the feelings as I'm saying them. So this is really a live event for me. This is really a live practice, personal practice for me. I'm not promoting anything. I'm not selling anything. I'm certainly not selling myself or my own awareness or understanding. I really do believe in the dictum, be skeptical of yourself most. When you feel like you have understood something or you think you have understanding, you should quickly realize you need to back up and, que and question that, those thoughts and assumptions because we're all works in progress and we're all exploring. One might, it might be true that to seek is to be distracted from being suchness, from being this. And I'm not attributing anything mystical at this point to my own experience of this. Ultimately, Stoicism, I'll be talking some about, I hope I'd like to talk about my experience with Stoicism in the future a little more. But ultimately, Stoicism is a materialistic view. And whereas Stoics, Romans, a lot of Romans were Stoics, they, it was very warlike. Sometimes the language is more aggressive towards yourself, domination, mastering yourself. But before them, before that, or around, I should say, the same time that I guess the same ideas for Stoicism were formulating and re, being recirculated, but around Socrates' time, they were asking the same, Socrates was asking the same questions of how shall we live? How best shall we live here? And I think that Pierre Hadot, who I spoke about last time and who I'll be reading more from in the future, definitely, definitely, he had his own experiences with mysticism. And I guess he would say he had his own kind of acceptance or realization in his life. And from that point on, everything was different in a way. And I really appreciate people who share that type of experience and who can articulate their experience and talk about it poetically, metaphorically, and also reasonably rationally. It is irrational, these kinds of experiences. And that's all personally I'm doing. I find it um, fascinating that we have a history at the same time being spontaneous here now and not grasping onto things and learning to hold things well and do things well, but not to hold on to things. But that's how I personally view this set of practices. They help remind me. I mentioned Pierre Hadot. He has he had his experience. He went off. He he said it. And in, in, I'll summarize or paraphrase. You can bank off into the oblivion if you don't ground yourself in something. When you go to look within the at the images and at the sources of thoughts and feelings, if, if you can even do such a thing. Can the mind see the mind? Probably not. Not only from our perspective of awareness. So anyway, a lot of these things I'm talking about are relating to consciousness and to one's own experience. Not an, This is not an academic theory or set of theories. These are my own personal experiences 
and expressing them this way is part of my own practice and ultimately I can only speak from my own experience and myself, my opinions and mine and I may paraphrase often I'm using the sources I find as an inspiration for my own personal kind of meditation about these things and I like to talk about them, I'm a verbal kind of thinker and I like to be in the moment and be spontaneous I might queue up my discussion with a couple notes and some articles, and then I'll just go from there and see what happens. Anyway, this is not an edited, produced effort. This is an expression. And I am open to hear your expressions and what you've experienced as well, to the extent that it can help me understand my experience better. But anyway, back to Socrates. So he really brought about a different way of... Of, of understanding the world, at least bringing it into conversation and into discussion. And uh, he's such a, his premise for always when asked is he felt he knew nothing. Earlier philosophical debates from Thales and Anaximander and Democritus, these were all theoretical. And, but human knowledge and understanding has advanced and was advancing then, but nothing in the world was directly changed by the theoretical discussions of philosophers much to that time. And Socrates based it in his experience. Hado veered more into mysticism and stoicism in his life. And I have to say, I have also experienced my own shift from maybe more pagan, Eastern influence, kind of Zen perspective. Taoist definitely influences and Buddhism as well. But not I am not religious, nor do I seek out religious experience, nor am I fronting for any kind of religious understanding or religious god or any kind of guru or anything like that. I, I personally don't see that kind of authority in nature. I see a lot of, I see order and I see chaos in nature. And what I'm exploring here in today's meditation is, is just about love. And what did Socrates have to say about love? And I think that's, if you do a search for Zen and, and love, you don't find a lot. <laughs> if you do a search for love and stoicism, you find quite a bit on that lived experience. Zen to me is in the moment, completely not grasping, um, aware, or ready uh, to act, awareness. But we live here, and we have needs, and we have emotions, and we have thoughts, and we get angry, and we get happy, and we are going up and down like waves, and some of us are pretty stable through those waves and have a solid paddle with us in a nice boat and we have strong muscles and others of us have no idea how to make it in that water and can quickly be swallowed up by the surf. So it's important to look at your foundations, the foundations of how you think. And Socrates is definitely a great place to start, not to start, but to focus on when you're really trying to tie all of this into your actual experience and how you're living. And I really appreciate anybody who's going to help me try to deal with and, and face this life and how to, how, to, how to live within it. And I take a lot of value out of from Socrates and Plato. I'm not a Neoplatonist. I'm not really anything. And that may seem very noncommittal of me, but there's a rational element within me that simply will not let me settle or hold on to anything when it comes to final understandings of anything. Information is always just coming up and receding like water, like waves, like, like the surf. And today, I hear Socrates crashing on the rocks. Okay. Socrates' focus on ethics was intended to generate practical, pragmatic outcomes. Why does he speak up? Why does he reach out? He said he felt a responsibility to. And it's like a philosophical midwife birthing human beings that thought and were centered in themselves so that they would be able to have the best kind of balance between thought and emotion and inner experience and outer experience. We've got to like ride between all that and it's very confusing for us and uh, nobody's got it all worked out and we're all just doing our best. I'm doing my best and I'm sharing my journey through it because perhaps it may be of assistance to another who may be learning to ride the waves too and uh, monkey see monkey do I guess or ape see ape do. Anyway, oh, I want to talk about apes at some point, too. I've been doing some studying on apes. Very interesting. Um, fascinated with YouTubes and ape videos <laughs> and watching those recently. So, anyway. So, back to Socrates. Although we have only come to see Socrates through the eyes of others, such as Plato and Xenophon, 
and his foes, like Aristophanes, they agree he wished to have an impact on the people around him and the kind of society they were creating as a result of their choices. He wanted, he saw a better way. So he was a progressive, okay? But he was very roguish and very outside in his influence and how he did things. He fascinates me, just fascinates me. What his friends and foes disagreed on was what motivated Socrates. Nietzsche was afraid Socrates was a cynic or was truly skeptical about life. I don't think that's true in my reading of him. But anyway, Socrates' critics slumped him in with sophists who were looked down on at that time as just uh, philosophical cowboys, basically. And so these guys were good arguers, good speakers, good thinkers. I might be in the sophist category myself. So I don't know, an unformed form, a uh, forming form, I guess you could say. A new focus on ethics. I'm reading some notes here. A new focus from some sources. So these are, these are crib notes. Please uh, understand. I'm just sharing my kind of a skip and a jump across a lot of different sources. And I'm not claiming any of this. Uh, I'm just interacting with it. Some of my original thoughts here, commentary on some others. But this is not, a, this is just personal. I'm not, I, I don't have time to give you all the bookmarks and all the, all the footnotes. Um, you're going to have to do your own work like I do. And which is no work at all, really. Like for me, make it fun. So I like to be spontaneous in my study. I guess you could say a tarot-like approach to knowledge. Pick a card. I like that. Pick a card. I definitely quite often pick a card and reflect off of that. But anyway, so Socrates brought a focus on ethics. That was really what, that's what he pointed at to help him live in between instinct and thought and emotion. And, he's, and he had his, an ethic that he spoke about. I'm going to look into Spinoza's ethics later. I'm making my way, I've skipped around, dabbled in it a little bit, but I'm not prepared to really have a cogent discussion about it. Anyway, or about my thoughts on Spinoza. But so Socrates' core question, you know, what ought one to do? So that just resonated with me. That's why I really resonate with Socrates. I asked the same question. Okay, then. I can't be sure of anything in this world. There's science telling me attributes about what is, but that doesn't tell me very much at the end of the day how to live within it. So, you know, it is helpful to know what not to touch and what to touch, what to eat, what not to eat. So I appreciate science and its perspective, but it is certainly only one way of knowing and uh, a very powerful way of knowing, and I certainly respect it. But f physics right now and science is really thinking that they can do away with philosophy and metaphysics and what have you. And I just have to say that it's just such an arrogance. As we move into machine consciousness interfaces and we don't even understand what consciousness is and they're ready to jettison the, the governor, the autopilot, the ethics, the checks and balances that we've stored up and learned over thousands of years and delete all those subroutines. That's ridiculous arrogance, ridiculous arrogance. And dangerous. And this world is dangerous. You gotta watch where you, walk, where you step and you gotta be careful what you do and and uh, yeah, you need to have a sense of your own right and wrong. And you have to work it out on your own at the end of the day, or you're just going to be following the crowd. And this is a world where following the crowd is going to, it's just, to me, it's just not worth, it's not enough. I don't want to be a part of a group of people per se. I don't want to be disconnected from people, but I also don't want to not consider my own life. And I certainly don't want to be told what to do. And I'm very resistant to fascism and authoritarianism of any sort, religious or secular. And that's not the way human beings are. We cooperate. Democracies are one of the better shots we've taken at cooperating. And, and it's based on noble lies, Plato's noble lies in, in some ways. And very, a lot of policies driven by Machiavellian kind of rationality and thinking. And hey, life happens here. I love the barking. I love the dogs barking. Anyway, I just don't like it when they get vicious at the other dogs. All right, that's enough. So Socrates was dangerous. In one fell swoop, he brought philosophy into the marketplace. He brought it to the common person. He made it, making it uh, relevant and accessible to all people. And he democratized philosophy. <laughs> Fascinating guy. What a guy. He just was driven. He had a will, man. And there's some, something behind this to dig into more mystical, yes, in one respect, but metaphorical more, I think, poetic, in, in more than uh, mystical, which may be the same thing at the end of the day. So he upset hierarchies and orthodoxies. Socrates eventually executed for 
crimes of impiety, corrupting the youth. What a reason to be killed for. If you think about it, in a way, and I'm not being a conspirator, but the encouragement for beautiful artists to flame out and die young from drugs, in a way, they're sentenced to death for corrupting the youth, for upsetting the order. And yeah, of course, anybody upsetting the order is dangerous. Anybody asking these questions that I'm asking here in my own life is dangerous, without a doubt. Radicals who are free radicals. And there is a measure of freedom in our choice. I'm not going to argue for free will or not. I can't really. Uh, certainly thousands of people could argue a lot better for either way than I could. But I will say, within my own life, I do know I have choice. And I've exercised it. I can choose to be disturbed about the world and the circumstances of it beyond my control, or I can accept it. And that's the heart of AA and how AA works. The very Based on Stoic principles, by the way. And Stoic principles, where do these principles come from? Ancient principles. Ancient wisdom distilled into systems. Which means there's a lot of fluff in there you got to sort through. But you can, we don't have the ancient world available to us, the ancient pre prehistoric world. We just, but man, there must have been, in their time, in, in Socrates' time, there must have been connections back to some of the, that ancient wisdom. And I wish more, we had more of those connections. But anyway, I believe really that they were iterating in a new way. Socrates was iterating in a new way, in a practical way in a conscious way, in an aware way, how to live with what we are. And so anyway, I think that's an excellent foundation to build an understanding of philosophy around. Keep it practical. Keep it relevant. Stay out of the clouds. Don't go into the depths without the proper equipment. You need to equalize the pressure as you go up and down these labyrinths of the mind, of the inner the labyrinths of the mind, you have to be careful. You can lose your way. You can go insane. So, I find it not an accident that in my journey into these spaces, I've come across a common wisdom, and that is to know thyself, that is to be skeptical of yourself, to be careful of listening to thoughts and emotions and making decisions from those places, it's really getting a little bit of a primer on how to use your consciousness. There are lots of sources and available information now through the internet, but there's so much garbage. You have to really go your own way and find your own sense of it and your own love of wisdom. I'm putting pings out there. But let's not lie about it. I'm being public about my inquiry into myself. And I think personally that's a part of a responsibility I feel. Not that I have things mastered. I have some, I've mastered a couple of things in my life and I've forgotten things I've mastered. Holding and not grasping. It's, that's for me, a lot of topics recently coming, resonating around that, those concepts. Holding and grasping. You can carry a lot more, a lot longer than you can holding on to it with your hands, grasping it you got to put your back into it. And you have to put your back into philosophy, and into your, which ultimately means you have to put your back into your life. And you have to mean it. It has to mean something for you, not to other people. Because then it's a trap. Then you feel trapped. Then you live trapped. And uh, you don't do your best work trapped. You do your best work relaxed. You have your best life relaxed. Coming from relaxation. And Socrates knew this. And I'm, you can feel a way, your way through here with your intuition. You can find these sources. It's fascinating. And they ping so loudly back at you. And you take notice. Parmenides is another one and, and some other Neoplatonists that I'm fascinated with. And just some early, you know, origin, church fathers. And a lot of people had to wear the mask of religion across the ages to hide their true search, which was to know themselves. And there's been a thread of that parental wisdom through much of our philosophy and into our culture. And there's many symbols that are tied back to that ancient history in our own culture, that perennial history. Socrates is certainly a person to help orient yourself to where these all these other swirling force pools of knowledge are influenced by. He's a great light, a great source of gravity, or he is a body, a significant body that I have noticed 
and the quality. And I we all, and I only know him through Plato. He was an in the moment guy, and I respect that. So I do feel as I've lived it, there must be some commonality. We're human beings, and we're only we're not separated by that many years. So there must be quite a bit of commonality in our experience. So in a way, you can embody, test these uh, ideas or these these discussions that Plato gives us. Yeah. Being asked who the wisest person in Athens was, the Oracle of Delphi nominated Socrates. Socrates was astounded because he believed himself to know nothing. And he truly believed that based on at least his students' writings about him and his enemies' writings about him. To prove his relative ignorance, Socrates sought out to find a wiser person among all the citizens of Athens, questioning them at length about the nature of things like justice and love. There's probably some myth in some of that that's come down to us from, what, 2,600 years. But I believe these were the founders of our modern mind, and our ideas of science grew out of the foundations that they laid. And they were building on other foundations given to them. You know, so it's in a way we don't have all the history, but we definitely we have to learn to trust our instincts, balance that with observations and put your finger in the air sometimes and feel the wind. It's an art. You got to bring all this together. Philosophy and life is an art. It's knowing when, it's knowing to how to just expend just the right amount of energy. Not too much, not too little. In the middle, you're most powerful because you have access to your full power. Your, all your strength can be focused in that space. And that is certainly a practice that you have to build and you have to exercise. You have to exercise the muscles to be to mentally, I don't want to say spiritually, but I want to say philosophically, physically and philosophically. I believe philosophy sits in the middle of religion and mysticism, material, material literalism and archetypal symbol. It's a filter. It's a translator. It's a Rosetta Stone. My God, the value of Socrates and Plato. My God, the gift of mind to be able to live in this linear time, to have a little bit of help. These are great lights to me. And they gave freely. Man, this life is fucking hard to goddamn live sometimes. And now the country is divided, but we're dividing as a cell divides. We're going to reproduce. There's going to be some new thing birthed out of all this. And that's what's happening in us. You birth yourself. These steps into philosophy, into yourself, into your mind and experience, into your observations, into your senses. Going deeper than the story given you. Making your own way, defining your own story, making your own myth, living your own myth, writing your own myth if you want. Whatever you want to do. What, what the hell? You're going to die. Do it. What are you waiting for? Death? It takes all of our life. It steals everything. It doesn't steal it. I don't believe it. I can't say what all these moments mean except to me. And to me, they're everything. I am my memory. I am these moments. And if I lost my memory and lost my mind, I would just be what I am, a blank slate, maybe a body, without consciousness. Or at least a mute consciousness, maybe. A true black box. No inputs, no outputs. It sounds hellish to me, that world, that kind of living. If I was stuck in my body, if I was stuck in my mind with no way to connect to anything, feeling completely sealed off, no light, nothing, darkness, that sounds horrible to my mind. It's repugnant, but there's also, that sounds blissful, nothing to pull on you. And I suppose that the, those views 
Those feelings represent not just duality within us. There's, I don't think we're a duality. I think we're a multiverse within ourselves. And multiple personalities, all of us. And masks galore. Some we let people see and some we don't. We're not living, I'm not living for others' opinions. My parents is in the you know, middle to the end of their lives, laid middle, and they've decided to go their own way. They don't have much gas left in the tank. As their son, I respect them, and I have to not agree with what they think or what they say to do, but they both, in my situation, they're both very hands-off, and I'm hands-off with them. Such is life, and probably all the better to be able to be able to have, be able to make kind of your own decisions free of your folk religion, free of your parents' gaze. In America, we're free to tell God to fuck off, and that in and of itself is, I think, an accomplishment. To be able to not be flayed or burned at the stake, to be able to say. Hey, that's great for you, man. For me, it's a little more stark. It's a little more real. I got to keep it grounded in my life. I can't. I can't let myself think, be thinking about heavens and hells. And I've got to just keep my shit together. And that's where I love men like Pierre Hado and James Hillman and even Jordan Peterson who lost his shit, which I actually appreciate a little. Appreciate him a little more for losing his shit and being humbled, because he was on a rocket ship. That guy. And I don't know that I was really going where he was going. But he had an influence on a lot of people. And a lot of men who have lost their way found something in that guy. And, Joe, and same with Joe Rogan. They love Joe Rogan. You know why? Because he's strong. And they want to be strong. And he's in control, at least to a degree. He's an animal. But he's in control. And they want that power. But that's the dream of a man. That's the dream of a boy. To be strong, to be, we get so much pressure to be this thing, this image. And I don't know about other men, I'm a very sensitive man myself. And I feel my emotions very deeply and they move me a great deal in my life. And it's taken me a long time to learn to work with them and not ignore them and not let them run amok, but to work with them and be informed by them and taught in ways and appreciate them in ways that I've never even I never could have before being so tossed around I felt myself in my life and then I guess we all have to go through our hell we got to find that we got to ask ourselves god damn there's got to be a, a better way there's got to be a better way this sounds more like a confession than a reading today I don't know. All right, let me get back to Socrates. So Socrates is like, holy shit, the Oracle of Delphi said, I'm the wisest in Athens. You can just see the guy going, no, like he doesn't want that. That's like a big deal to them. Everyone came from all over the world to talk to the oracle. And we'll, let's talk about the oracle another time because then all the oracles went quiet and then our minds evolved to this. Could it be? Obviously, there's a correlation. The emperor, the emperor's naked. I don't know. I love that then the story of the myth or is that Socrates goes and begins to ask the true nature of things. He goes to the, he goes to the simplest things. To, to find true nature. And that's first principles. That's good. That's smart. His questioning had practical implications. He was looking for the essence of how to live. This is a guy to listen for, to get anything you can out of this guy, man. This is good stuff. So, as Socrates was beginning his quest of all of the common people and asking questions. Um, I guess the myth is that's where he developed his Socratic method, which was a distinctive form of questioning designed to open space for insight and self-knowledge. Those subjected to it did not necessarily enjoy the experience or see it in a positive light. 
there's no doubt uh, that contributed to the belief that Socrates was an impious troublemaker. So here you have Socrates going around Athens asking everyone these questions, and he's seeking an answer to, you know, what can you know? <laughs> I think that's kind of funny. Um, that's why I think this is maybe more of a kind of, you know, this is kind of more of the so Socratic myth. Um, but still, um, you know, I have a certain style of expressing myself where I'm not so much in a dialogue as much as I'm kind of sharing the impressions of the moment and they tend to sometimes really correlate or synchronize, you know, with the other person that I may be communicating with. So it's a very strange process. Um, but uh, it's a one-on-one -on -one kind of exchange. Um, and, you know, a lot of times you just don't know where somebody is and you kind of see what resonates with somebody. You throw a couple rocks in the, in the, in the lake and you see what ripples. And, you know, I've just been playing with this, my own form, I guess, of my own Socratic method for the last few years. And um, I can't say that uh, people always understand what I'm doing. Um, I don't always explain it. I just kind of, um, you know, I let the contact kind of take its own form and its own direction. And I don't really read much into it or question it or try to change it. And uh, I don't know. That's just, uh, you know, what I found in my life. But all right, I'm going to do some reading here. Um, so this is um, uh, on the importance of the examined life. Although Socrates contributed many insights that are still drawn upon today, but not necessarily accepted, one of the most famous and profound is his claim that the unexamined life is not worth living. This claim goes beyond being a recommendation we should think before we act, which may be a prudent thing to do. Socrates is attempting to draw our attention to a deeper truth about the human condition. He encourages us to participate in a form of being that has the capacity to transcend the requirements of instinct and desire in order to make conscious, that is, ethical choices. Socrates claimed if we fail to do this, we live a lesser life. One of the effects of examination is, according to Socrates, the development of phronesis, practical, wis practical wisdom which is the foundation of virtue. For Socrates and later for Aristotle in a slightly different form, the possession of virtue is not just a matter of interior orientation. It is essential to being able to see the world as it is and be able to make good decisions. Like Aristotle, Socrates sees vice as the source of defective vision. Socrates thought people make bad choices and do bad things out of ignorance. He thought if people could only see what is good, they would choose it. This all finally comes together in the way that Socrates challenged the status quo. To live and examine life is to reject things that ought to be done just because they've always been done a certain way. Instead, Socrates is an, is an early exponent of an inner voice that, in Socrates' case, is supposed to have warned him against making an error. Socrates called this voice his demonic sign, something Aquinas would call conscience over a thousand years later. It may be difficult to distinguish the real Socrates from the versions of the man created by others, which were either celebratory or lampooning, but this we know. When given the chance to escape and avoid the sentence of death imposed on him by the Athenians, Socrates chose to stay. In defense of his ideas and in conformance with his ideals, um, so Socrates drank the hemlock and died. So I'm going to now read... Socrates's argument in Plato's Symposium, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Benjamin Jowett. This is a very, uh, this is kind of a very interesting and very famous um, collection of dialogues that Plato wrote, and Plato was basically trying to or he did indict Eros or indict love and some other poets gave defenses of love and finally Aristophanes gave a a very erotic account of love from a 
perspective of Zeus, a wild energy, instinct, Eros. And Plato was asking, does Eros have a place in a just society? This is quite a profound argument uh, or dialogue uh, between um, these characters. And they're in the house of Agathon, Socrates, um, after everyone, after, uh, after folks have given some of their, their arguments for and against love, um, Socrates goes and gives his account of love. And basically what Socrates is, is saying in his argument is that Eros is a very destructive, can be a very destructive, dissolving force. And there's always forces within society that are trying to demythologize the power, the power of Eros. And you could see those kinds of correlations in our democracy today between, you know, the way the conservative movement tries to limit the cultural changes brought about by progressives or hippies or the woke, you know. Um, so this is a very relevant, I think, argument today. And I think we still are asking this question, how do we live with love in our society? And how do we let love have a place in our society and in our culture? And this is, this is, you know, an ancient question within human societies. And, um, what Plato, what, what the dialogues begin to hint at is that there is we're kind of humanity is from a from a mythological perspective you know plato is is basically trying to say that you know he himself a poet is 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 condemning poets in the dialogue con condemning the poets in the dialogue but they're kind of double meanings in the and how he's presenting things and how he presents the arguments because he basically is speaking about or speak or, or saying that there's a hole within us that you know, can never be filled. And this love comes from that, that nothing, that hole there. And we seek to fill that. And erotic love or eros, you know, comes and it, it's not a, it's a lower form of, of the divine love, or I guess the virtuous love that Socrates is, is speaking about. And where Socrates goes with this is he says, you know, eros must be guided. And it must be Put to productive use within society in the service of, of virtue in the love of wisdom and a person that is develops that love of wisdom will foster a place to transmute this wild energy of love within us an instinct into productive into a productive existence um that's pretty profound as far as you know that's very profound to me, and this is a very, a, a really good capstone, I think, on my meditation here on Socrates. So um, I will continue on now and uh, read from um, picking up from Socrates' defense of, of love. And now, said Socrates, I will ask about love. Is love of something or of nothing? Of something, surely, he Ag Agathon replied. Keep in mind what this is, and tell me what I want to know, whether love desires that of which love is. Yes, surely. And does he possess or does he not possess that which he loves and desires? Probably not, I should say. Nay, replied Socrates. I would have, I would have you consider whether necessarily is not rather the word, the inference that he who desires something is in want of something, and that he who desires nothing is in want of nothing, is in my judgment, Agathon, absolutely and necessarily true. What do you think? I agree with you, said Agathon. Very good. Would he who is great desire to be great, or is he who is strong desire to be strong? That would be inconsistent with our previous admissions. True, for he who is anything cannot want to be that which he is. Very true. And yet, added Socrates, if a man being strong desired to be strong, or being swift desired to be swift, or being healthy desired to be healthy, in that case, 
he might be thought to desire something which he already has or is. I give the example in order that we may avoid misconception. For the possessors of these qualities, Agathon, must be supposed to have their respective advantages at that time, whether they choose or not, and who can desire that which he has. Therefore, when a person says, I am well and wish to be well, or I am rich and wish to be rich, and I desire simply to have what I have to him, we shall reply, you, my friend, having wealth and health and strength, want to have the continuance of them. For at this moment, whether you choose or no, you have them. And when you say, I desire that which I have and nothing else, is not your meaning that you want to have what you now have in the future? He must agree with us, must he not? He must, replied Agathon. Then said Socrates, he desires that what he has at present may be preserved to him in the future, which is equivalent to saying that he desires something which is not existent to him, and which as yet he has not got. Very true, he said. Then he and everyone who desires, desires that which he has not already, and which is future and not present, and which he is not, and is not, and of which he is in want. These are the sort of things which love and desire seek. Very true, he said. Then now, said Socrates, let us recapitulate the argument. First, is not love of something, and of something too which is wanting to a man? Yes, he replied. Remember further that you said in your speech, or if you do not remember, I will remind you, you said that the love of the beautiful set in order, set in order the empire of the gods, for that of deformed things there is no love. Did you not say something of that kind? Yes, said Agathon. Yes, my friend, and the remark was a just one. And if this is true, love is the love of beauty and not of deformity? He assented. And the admission has been already made that love is of something which a man wants and has not? True, he said. Then love wants and has not beauty? Certainly, he replied. And would you call that beautiful which wants and does not possess beauty? Certainly not. Then would you still say that love is beautiful? Agathon replied, I fear that I did not understand what I was saying. You made a very good speech, Agathon, replied Socrates, but there is yet one small question which I would fain ask. Is not the good also the beautiful? Yes. Then in wanting the beautiful, love wants also the good? I cannot refute you, Socrates, said Agathon. Let us assume that what you say is true. Say rather, beloved Agathon, that you cannot refute the truth, for Socrates is easily refuted. Ha! <laughs> I like that. Um... You know, we originally uh, perhaps were a whole being, male and female, and Zeus split us in basically punishment for taking sides against the gods or something like that. Um, very interesting. That was the previous image. Um, kind of primitive, but I, I really think it's a powerful image. Um, okay, so continuing on. All right, uh, Socrates continues. And now, taking my leave of you, I would rehearse the tale of love, which I heard from Diotima of Matania, a woman wise in this and in many other kinds of knowledge, who in the days of old, when the Athenians offered sacrifice before the coming of the plague, delayed the disease ten years. She was my instructor, instructress in the art of love, and I shall repeat to you what she said to me, beginning with the admissions made, of, made by Agathon, which are nearly, if not quite, the same which I made to the wise woman when she questioned me. I, as you, Agathon, suggested, I must speak first of the being and nature of love, and then of his works. First I said to her, in nearly the same words which he used in me, that love was a mighty God, and likewise fair, and she proved to me, as I proved to him, that by my own showing, love was neither fair nor good. What do you mean, Diatoma? I said. Is love then evil and foul? Hush, she cried. Must that be foul, which is not fair? Certainly, I said. And is that which is not wise ignorant? Do you not see that there is a mean between wisdom and ignorance? And that may, and what may that be, I said. Right opinion, she replied, which, as you know, being incapable of giving a reason, is not knowledge. For how can knowledge be devoid of reason? Nor again, ignorance, for neither can ignorance attain the truth, but is clearly something which is a mean between ignorance and wisdom. Quite true, I replied. Do not then insist, she said, that 
this is not fair is of necessity foul or what is not good evil or infer that or infer that because love is not fair and good he is therefore foul and evil for he is in a mean between them well i said love is surely admitted by all to be a great god by those who know or by those who do not know by all and how socrates she said with a smile can love be acknowledged to be a great god by those who say that he is not a god at all and who are they i said you and I are two of them, she replied. How can that be, I said. It is quite intelligible, she replied. For you yourself would acknowledge that the gods are happy and fair. Fair, of course. You would, um, you would, would to say that any god was not? Certainly not, I replied. And you mean by the happy, those who are the possessors of these, of these th things good or fair? Yes. And you admitted that love, because he was in want, desires those good and fair things of which he is in want? Yes, I did. But how can he be a god who has no portion in what is either good or fair, impossible? Then you see that you also deny the divinity of love. What then is love? Socrates asked. Is he mortal? No. What then? As in the former instance, he is neither mortal nor immortal, but in mean between the two. What is he, Diatima? He is a great spirit, Diamond, and like all spirits, he is intermediate between the divine and the mortal and what i said is his power he interprets she replied between gods and men conveying and taking across to the gods the prayers and sacrifices of men and to men the commands and replies of the gods he is the mediator who spans the chasm which divides them and therefore in him all is bound together and through him the arts of the prophet and the priest their sacrifices and mysteries and charms and all prophecy and incantation find their way for God mingles not with man, but through love. All the intercourse and converse of God and, con and converse of God and man, whether awake or asleep, is carried on. The wisdom which understands this is spiritual, inside. All other wisdom, such as that of arts and handicrafts, is mean and vulgar in comparison. Now these spirits, or intermediate powers, are many and diverse, and one of them is love. And who, I said, was his father, and who was his mother? The tale, she said, will take time. Nevertheless, I will tell you. On the birthday of Aphrodite, there was a feast of the gods, at which the god Poros and Plenty, who is the son of Metis and Discretion, was one of the guests. When the feast was over, Panea, or Poverty, as the manner is on such occasions, came about the doors to beg. Now Plenty, who was the worst for nectar, there was no wine in those days, went into the garden of Zeus and fell into a heavy sleep. And Poverty, considering her own straitened circumstances, plotted to have a child by him. The truth of the matter is this, no god is a philosopher or seeker after wisdom, for he is wise already, nor does any man who is wise seek after wisdom, neither do the ignorant seek after wisdom, for herein is the evil of ignorance, that he who is neither good nor wise is nevertheless satisfied with himself. He has no desire for that of which he feels no want. But who then, Diotima, I said, are the lovers of wisdom, if they are neither the wise nor the foolish? A child may answer that question, she replied. They are those who are in a mean between the two. Love is one of them. For wisdom is a most beautiful thing, and love is of the beautiful. And therefore love is also a philosopher, or a lover of wisdom. And being a lover of wisdom is in a mean between the wise and the ignorant. And of this too is birth. This too his birth is the cause. For his father is wealthy and wise, and his mother poor and foolish. Such, my dear Socrates, is the nature of the spirit love. The error in your con conception of him was very natural, and as I imagine from what you say has arisen out of a confusion of love and the beloved, which made you think that love was all beautiful, for the beloved is the truly beautiful and delicate and perfect and blessed, but the principle of love is of another nature, and is such as I have described. I said, O oh, thou stranger woman, thou sayest well, but assuming love to be such as you say, what is the use of him to men? That, Socrates, she replied, I will attempt to unfold, of his nature and birth, of already spoken. I said, O thou stranger woman, thou sayest well, but assuming love to be such as you say, what is the use of him to men? That, Socrates, she replied, I will attempt to unfold, of his nature and birth I have already spoken, and you acknowledge that love is of the beautiful, but someone will say, of the beautiful in what? Socrates and Diotima, 
or rather let me put the question more dearly and ask when a man loves this beautiful what does he desire i answered her that the beautiful may be his still she said the answer suggests a further question what is given by the possession of beauty to what you have asked i replied i have no answer ready then she said let me put the word good in the place of the beautiful and repeat the question once more if he who loves good what is it that he loves the possession of the good i said and what does he gain who possesses the good happiness i replied there is less difficulty in answering that question yes she said the happy are made happy by the acquisition of good things nor is there any need to ask why a man desires happiness the answer is already final you are right i said and is this wish and this desire common to all and do all men always desire their own good or only some men what say you all men i replied the desire is common to all why then she she rejoined are not all men socrates uh, are not all men socrates said to love but only some of them whereas you say that all men are always loving the same things i myself wonder i said why this is there is nothing to wonder at she replied there is poetry which as you know is complex and manifold all creation or passage of non-being into being is poetry or making and the processes of all art are creative and the masters of arts are all poets of all of arts are all poets or makers very true still she said you know that they are not called poets but have other names only that portion of the art which is separated off from the rest and is concerned with music and meter is termed poetry and they who possess poetry in this sense of the word are called poets very true i said and the same holds of love for you may say generally that all desire of good and happiness is only the great and subtle power of love but they who are drawn towards him by any other path whether the path of money making or gymnastics or philosophy are not called lovers the name of the whole is appropriated to those whose affection takes one form only they alone are said to love or to be lovers i dare say i replied that you are right yes she added and you hear people say that lovers are seeking for their other half but i say that they are seeking neither for the half of themselves nor for the whole unless the half or the whole be also a good and they will cut off their own hands and feet and cast them away if they are evil for they love not what is their own until perchance there be some someone who calls what belongs to him the good and what belongs to another the evil for there is nothing which men love but the good is there anything certainly i i should say that there is nothing then she said the simple truth is that men love the good yes i said to which must be added that the love that they love the possession of the good yes that must be added and not only the possession but the the everlasting possession of the good that must be added too then love she said may be described generally as the love of the everlasting possession of the good that is most true socrates said then if this be the nature of love can you tell me further she said what is the manner of the pursuit what are they doing who show all this eagerness and heat which is called love and what is the object with which they have in view answer me nay diotima i replied if i had known i should not have wondered at your wisdom neither should i have come to learn from you about this very matter well she said i will teach you the object the object which they have in view is birth and beauty whether of body or soul i do not understand you i said the oracle requires an explanation i will make my meaning dearer she replied i mean to say that all men are bringing to the birth in their bodies and in their souls there is a certain age at which human nature is desirous of procreation procreation which must be in beauty and not in deformity and this procreation is the union of man and woman and is a divine thing for conception and generation are an immortal principle in the mortal creature and in the inharmonious they can never be but the deformed is always inharmonious with the divine and the beautiful harmonious beauty then is the destiny of goddess a par of a part uh, turretician who presides at birth and therefore when approaching beauty the conceiving power is propitious and diffusive and benign and begets and bears fruit at the sight of ugliness she frowns and contracts and has a sense of pain and turns away and shrivels up and not without a pang refrains from conception and this is the reason why when the hour of conception arrives and the teeming nature is full 
there is such a flutter and ecstasy about beauty whose approach is the alleviation of the pain of travail. For love, Socrates, is not as you imagine the love of the beautiful only. What then? The love of generation and of birth in beauty? Yes, I said. Yes, indeed. She replied, but why of generation? Because to the mortal creature, generation is a sort of eternity and immortality, she replied. And if, as has been already admitted, love is of the everlasting possession of the good, all men will necessarily desire immortality together with good, where, wherefore love is of immortality. All this she taught me at various times when she spoke of love, and I remember her once saying to me, What is the cause, Socrates, of love and the attendant desire? See you not how all animals, birds, as well as beasts, and their desire of procreation are in agony when they take the infection of love, which begins with the desire of union, whereto is added the care of offspring, on whose behalf the weakest are ready to battle against the strongest, even to the uttermost, and to die for them, and, and will let themselves be tormented with hunger or suffer anything in order to maintain their young? Man may be supposed to act thus from reason, but why should animals have this these dispassionate feelings. Can you tell me why? Again, I replied that I do not know. And she said to me, and you, ex and do you expect ever to become a master in the art of love if you do not know this? But I've told you already, Diatima, that my ignorance is the reason why I've come to you, for I am conscious that I want to teach her. Tell me then the cause of this and of the other mysteries of love. Marvel not, she said, if you believe that love is of the immortal as we have several times acknowledged, for here again, and on the same principle too, the mortal nature is seeking as far as is possible to be everlasting and immortal, and this is only to be attained by generation, because generation always leaves behind a new existence in the place of the old. Nay, even in the life of the old individual there is a secession and not absolute unity. A man is called the same, and yet in the short interval which elapses between youth and age, in which every animal is said to have life and identity, he is undergoing a perpetual process of loss and reparation. Hair, flesh, bones, blood, and the whole body are always changing, which is true not only of the body but also of the soul, whose habits, tempers, opinions, desires, pleasures, pains, fears never remain the same in any one of us, but are always coming and going, and equally true of knowledge. And that is still more surprising to us mortals. Not only do the sciences in general spring up and decay so that in respect of them we are never the same, but each of them individually ex experiences a like change. For what is implied in the word recollection but the departure of knowledge, which is ever being forgotten is, and is renewed and preserved by recollection, and appears to be the same although in reality new, according to the law of succession by which all mortal things are preserved. Not absolutely the same, but by substitution, the old worn-out mortality, leaving another new and similar existence behind, unlike the divine, which is always the same and not another? And in this way, Socrates, the mortal body, or mortal anything, partakes of immortality, but the immortal is another way. Marvel not, then, at the love which all men have of their offspring, for that universal love and interest is for the sake of immortality. I was astonished at her words, and said, Is this really true, O thou wise Diotima? And she answered with all the authority of an accomplished sophist, of that, Socrates, you may be assured. Think only of the ambition of men, and you will wonder at the senselessness of their ways, unless you consider how they are stirred by the love of an immortality of fame. They are ready to run all risks greater far than they would have for their own children, and to spend money and undergo any sort of toil, and even to die for the sake of leaving behind them a name which shall be eternal. Do you imagine that Alcestis would have died to save Admet Admetus or Achilles to avenge Patru um, Patroculus, or your own Codrus, in order to preserve the kingdom for his sons, if they had not imagined that the memory of their virtues, which still survive, survives among us, would be immortal? Nay, she said, I am persuaded that all men do all things, and the better they are, the more they do them, in hope of the glorious fame of immortal virtue, for they desire the immortal. These are the these are the lesser mysteries of love, and to even into which even you, Socrates, may enter. To the greater and more hidden ones, which are the crown of these, and to which, if you pursue them in a right spirit, they will lead, I know not whether you will be able to attain. But I will do my utmost to inform you, and, and you follow if you can. For he who, could, who would proceed aright in this matter should begin in youth to visit beautiful forms, and first, if he be guided by an instructor all right, a right to love one such form only out of that he should he should create fair thoughts and soon he will of himself perceive that the beauty of one form is akin to the beauty of another 
And then if beauty of form in general is his pursuit, how foolish would he be not to recognize that the beauty in every form is and is and the same. And when he perceives this, he will abate his violent love for the one which he will despise and deem a small thing and will become a lover of all beautiful forms. And the next stage, he will consider that the beauty of the mind is more honorable than the beauty of the outward form. So that if a virtuous soul have but a little comeliness, he will be content to love and tend him and will search out and bring to birth thoughts which may improve the young until he is compelled to contemplate and see the beauty of institutions and laws and to understand that the beauty of all is of one family and the personal beauty is a trifle. And after laws and institutions, he will go into the sciences that he may see their beauty, being not like a servant in love with the beauty of one youth or man or institution himself, a slave, mean and narrow-minded, but drawing towards and contemplating the vast sea of beauty. He will create many fair and noble thoughts and notions and boundless love and wisdom until on that shore he grows and waxes strong. And at last the vision is revealed to him of a single science, which is the science of beauty everywhere. To this I will proceed, pleased to give me your very best attention. He, he who has been instructed thus far in the things of love and who has learned to see the beautiful in due order and succession, when he comes toward the end, will suddenly perceive a nature of wondrous beauty. And this, Socrates, is the final cause of all our former, tor former toils, a nature which in the first place is everlasting, not growing or decaying or waxing and waning, secondly, not fair in one point of view and foul in another, or at one time or in one relation, or at one place fair, at another time, or in another relation, or at another place foul, as if fair to some and foul to others, or in the likeness of a face or hands or any part of the bodily frame, or in any form of speech or knowledge, or existing in any other being, as for example in an animal, or in heaven, or in earth, or in any other place, but beauty absolute, separate, simple, and everlasting, which without diminution and without increase or any change is imparted to the ever-growing and perishing beauties of all other things. He who from these ascending under the influence of true love begins to perceive that beauty is not far from the end. And the true order of going or being led by another to the things of love is to begin from the beauties of earth and mount upwards for the sake of that other beauty, using these as steps only, and from one going on to two, and from two to all the fair forms, and from fair forms to fair practices, and from fair practices to fair notions, until from fair notions he arrives at the notion of absolute beauty, and at last knows what the essence of beauty is. This, my dear Socrates, said the stranger of Mantinea, is that life above all others which man should live, and the contemplation of beauty absolute, a beauty which, if he once beheld, you would see not to be after the measure of gold and garments and fair boys and youths, um, whose presence now entrances you, <laughs> and you and many a one would be content to live seeing them only and conversing with them without meat or drink. If that were possible, you only want to look at them and to be with them. But what if man had eyes to see the true beauty, the divine beauty, I mean pure and dear and un unalloyed, not clogged with the pollutions of mortality and all the colors and vanities of human life, uh, think uh, thither looking and holding converse with the true beauty simple and divine. Remember how in that communion only, beholding beauty with the eye of the mind, he will be enabled to bring forth not images of beauty, but realities. For he has hold not of an image, but of a reality. And bringing forth and nourishing true virtue to become the friend of God and, the, and be immortal, if mortal man may. Would that be an ignoble life? Such Phaedrus and I speak not only to you, but to all of you were the words of Diotima, and I am persuaded of their truth. And being persuaded of them, I, sh I try to persuade others that in the attainment of this end, human nature will not easily find a helper better than love. And therefore also, I say that every man ought to honor him as I myself honor love, and walk in his ways, and exhort others to do the same, and praise and power and spirit of love according to the measure of my ability now and ever. The words which I have spoken, you Phaedrus, may call an encomium of love or anything else which you please. When Socrates had had done speaking, the company applauded, and Aristophanes was beginning to say something in answer to the illusion which Socrates had made to his own speech, when suddenly there was a great knocking at the door of the house, as of as of revelers and the sound of a flute girl was heard.